getting God's vision. Amen? Amen. Come on, a lot of times the church is talking about a personal vision. But I think to a certain degree, we've lost God's vision. And who cares about a personal vision? Matter of fact, I can't really have a great personal vision if it's not fitting into God's vision. (laughs) My personal vision should be in harmony or a part of the overall vision of God. Amen? And so let's go ahead and jump into it and take a look. Praise the Lord. The first scripture that we'll turn to is uh, right here in Acts chapter uh, 3, verse 19 through 22. It says, stop doing wrong things and turn to God again. Then the wrong things that you have done will be wiped away altogether. God cast your sin as far as the east is from the west. The Lord will give you a new start and make you very glad. How many have experienced that? Come on, man. I I still remember at 19 years old when I gave my life to Jesus. And all of a sudden, all the stuff I knew I was doing that was not according to God was wiped away. And I remember the joy. I remember the peace. Man, I remember going outside and it seemed like the green in the trees were greener. And the blue of the sky was a little bit bluer. Amen. Like it was, it was a brand new start. And I was so happy that I found Jesus. Now, now he, God, is going to send you Jesus. He was the one that God chose to be the Christ, the Messiah. And, and God is going to send Jesus to return again. He's going to come again. But the Bible goes on to tell us, it says, but he must, say it with me, wait in heaven He's got to wait. Well, what is he waiting in heaven for? So Jesus came to the earth, died our death, but then he ascended into heaven. And when he ascended, the Bible tells us he sat down at the right hand of God the Father to rule and reign as the king of the world. Now, he rules from heaven, and he's going to wait and stay in heaven until the time when all things will be made new again as they were at first. He stays in heaven into the renewal of all things. When's Jesus going to come again? When the earth is ready for the renewal of all things. Now, we'll look in a minute and we'll see what that means. But I just need you to see the scripture. Can you see this? Amen. Jesus who ascends into heaven and he's sitting at the right hand of God the Father. And and, and there is a task to be done on the earth, which is the reason why Jesus sent the Spirit of God into the earth and gave you and me the Holy Spirit. Stay in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high and then go and be my witnesses to all the nations. He gave us an assignment and he gave us the ability or the power, the one that would empower us to fulfill the assignment. The church still has a mission And we have got to be about our Father's mission. And I think sometimes we get to be about more ourselves than we do the mission. The mission gets lost in the details somehow. And I don't know that we've got the full vision of what God is seeing, what our mission will accomplish, and what our mission will create. And if we ever saw the new world that was waiting to be born as we accomplished the assignment of God, I think that we would be about our Father's business a little bit more often. Come on, there are whole groups of people that see something that needs to be done in the earth that will lead to the earth's benefit. And they're not even saved, and they will organize around that vision so that they can accomplish that and feed the homeless or whatever that vision might be. How much more the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, especially when we begin to realize that the world we're creating literally, come on, Father, 
that art in heaven. Holy is your name. Your kingdom come so that your will gets done on the earth as it is in heaven. God is wanting his kingdom to expand because the more Christ is in human hearts, the less evil the earth is. The more God's will gets accomplished in the earth, the more Jesus is in. Come on, could you imagine an earth where everyone was saved? Where everybody walked in the love of God was honest with each other, cared about each other genuinely like a family. What makes this earth cause us to experience the pain we're experiencing? There's one answer, everybody. Sin. And see, what, what we don't get is that our sin has far-reaching impacts. Sin isn't an isolated event. If I sin and I stumble and I mess up, man, I can mess up my marriage. I can destroy my children. I, and, and if I sinned as a pastor and messed up, right, enough, then I could hurt you guys. I could send I could send a wave of pain if I choose to yield to sin. Can I tell you, people are not starving in this earth because we don't have enough resources to feed everybody. They're starving in this earth because people are greedy. They're starving in this earth because of wars. They're starving in this earth because of all other types of events and tragedies that are coming about because sin dwells here. But what if, just what if, what if God became the king of all the earth? What if everyone ended up surrendering themselves to his lordship. We could, we could beat our swords into plowshares. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? We wouldn't need to train for war anymore. Instead of spending the billions and trillions that get spent in the, every year around the globe, think, would there be any homeless I'm just saying, I'm not trying to say that, I'm not trying to come up with some golden society or some lofty ideal. I'm just saying, I don't think that the church dreams about that enough. That we have a vision that if we do what we're supposed to do, that whether we make it to that ideal or not, maybe Jesus comes back before that happens. But how much pain and suffering will we be relieving from the earth because heaven is heaven because sin isn't there? And the less sin is here, guess what? The more heaven-like this experience of life becomes. Can you see this? Sin is what destroyed it all in the first place. So the more righteousness that gets established into the earth, the more the earth starts looking like heaven. Now, it's never going to fully look like heaven until the return of Christ. But there are objectives that God has for the church for us to do before he returns. He is waiting in heaven until the time when the thing, all things are made. They're ready to get made new again just like they were in the Garden of Eden. And that's when he's coming back. That's why the last enemy that gets put underfoot is death, and he destroys it at his coming. And all things now get made new. Now, by his holy prophets, God spoke of all of this from the very, very beginning. This was always God's plan in Jesus. 
is that, he, is that Jesus would plant a seed into the disciples, and the disciples would plant a seed into the nations, and the nations would start planting seeds, and the tree of God would just keep growing and growing till every, come on, starts as a small mustard seed, but it just keeps growing till all the birds of the air come and rest in the church's branches. It's always been God's vision. And the more that we accomplish it, the less pain this world experiences. All right, let's go on to our next verse. Praise the Lord. Psalms 47, 1 through 9. Uh, clap hands. Clap your hands, everybody. All you people, and sing to God in a voice of praise. That's what I want you to do. Clap your hands and sing to the Lord. Why are we clapping our hands? Sing to the Lord. Why are we exalting Him and praising Him and magnifying Him, glorifying Him? Why are we doing that? Because Lord Jehovah is exalted and He is awesome. That's why He is, he is ascended and He is awesome. And He is now the great King over all of the earth. That's what happened when he ascended and he's sitting at the right hand of God the Father. He became the great king over all of the earth. Now, the, now the prophet looks into a future, and, and, and we always put this into the millennial reign, but I'm not so sure that this is where this belongs. I think this belongs at the end of the church age, right before Jesus returns. Listen. For he has now subdued for us, who's us? The church. He subdued for us the nations under us. The nations get subdued underneath his church. Do we even think this way or dream this way? We're waiting for all of the nations of the earth to be subdued under a antichrist. And when every nation is subdued under the Antichrist, then Jesus is going to return. That's not what the Bible says. It's when, it's when all the nations are subdued under the church is when Jesus returns. All the people underneath our feet. Come on. Today you are my child. Today I have begotten you. This is talking about Jesus, everyone. Jesus comes out of the grave, and he is the first fruit of the resurrection. He is the first one to be raised from the dead, and God says, that's my boy. <laughs> that's my child. Today I have begotten you. Then he says to him, ask me, and I will give you the nations as your inheritance. I will give you the ends of the earth as your possession." Who? Jesus. There is a day that is coming when all nations will serve the Lord. That the seeds of the church continue to plant and populate until all nations are serving the Lord. You say, David, it's impossible. <laughs> That's kind of God's specialty, everyone. It's to take the things we think are impossible and boom, he does them and makes them possible. And that's why we're singing praises and we're glorifying him because he's exalted on his throne and he is awesome. No one else could do it but Jesus. But Jesus can. Not only can he, he's going to. You say, Pastor David, you're messing with my theology. I'm just showing you scriptures. <laughs> what verse don't you like? <laughs> I'm just saying that maybe the future of the church is a little bit more hopeful than what we've been taught. It goes on to say this, praise the Lord. It says, he has chosen us for his inheritance. Ask me, and I will give the nations as your inheritance. The ends of the earth as your. He chose you. In the honor of Jacob, whom he loved, God went up in glory. Jesus ascended. Lord Jehovah, with the sound of the trumpet, so sing 
to God in glory. Sing to our king. Because when did he become our king? The, the minute he went up in glory. Because the king of the whole earth, it is now God. Satan is not the God of the earth anymore. Jesus has conquered the devil, and he is king. And for this purpose, the Son of God was manifest to destroy what Satan built, to destroy the works of the devil. Satan took 4,000 years to build a great idol that Jesus came, the stone of God, and hit at the feet, shattering the idol. And all of a sudden, the, Daniel tells us his kingdom begins to emerge. And it keeps covering the earth. It just keeps expanding and growing till it covers the whole world. This verse goes on to tell us this, praise the Lord, that it says, sing praises to him. Man, this is a lot of praising, isn't it? Amen. Sing, like, just get some, you all need to get some praise about you, get some joy in you. Stop, stop being filled with such fear or hopelessness. Because God reigns over the nations. God sits upon his holy throne. And there is a day coming where the rulers of the nations were turned to the God of Abraham. There is a day coming when the rulers of the earth get saved. The church completes its mission, its assignment. Because the dominion of the earth are God's. Satan doesn't have it anymore because Jesus conquered Satan. And he is greatly exalted. Amen. Man, when God started showing me this stuff, it messed with my brain. I'm telling you, this is not what I used to believe. But the more that I started to look into the scriptures... Why? Because I was taught dispensational premillennialism. <laughs> I was taught an antichrist is coming and God is just going to rescue a broken, beat up church. And Jesus is going to have to come and save us all from it uh, because we're powerless and we're so weak. But that is not what the Bible teaches, everybody. He is coming back for a glorious bride without spot and wrinkle. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. So, so I'm not telling you I've got it all figured out. But you know what I am telling you? I'm telling you that there's a lot more hope in our future that the Bible teaches us than what we've been taught. That there is an assignment and an omission that we are on by God, and that Jesus in coming back till our mission is complete. So we better get about our Father's business. Amen? That the more we get about our Father's business, the more like heaven this earth will become, because the more Christ is in human hearts, he pours his love into those hearts, and before you know it, guess what? The hate and all that type of stuff, and right? The, 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 the sin, he starts cleansing these earthen vessels. Amen. I'm just trying to tell you that, that Democrats or Republicans are not the solution to the problems. That the church has always been God's solution. And that the more that we are letting people in and bringing them into the gospel of Jesus, and the more God is entering into people's lives, God is the Savior of the earth. We will never be able to legislate love. But God moving into somebody's heart will change everything. It's going to change everything all the time. How do you know? Because I was as hard as they came. And love changed me. How about you? 
Come on, man. They couldn't rehabilitate the hell out of me. <laughs> they couldn't incarcerate the hell out of you. But God's love comes in. And all the hell inside of everyone I know, it just starts leaving their life. Through the power of God's spirit. Church, you are the answer. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Amen. So, praise the Lord. Go ahead, throw up the next verse. Praise God. So, so Matthew, that's exactly what Jesus told his disciples. He said, guys, this is what I want you to pray. Father, who is in heaven, man, we uphold the holiness of your name. So bring in your kingdom so that your will is done on earth as it's done in heaven. Bring in your kingdom because as your kingdom invades the earth, your will starts getting done on the earth. Now, God's kingdom, Jesus told you, it doesn't come with observation. You're not going to be able to look and say, hey, there it is over there, or here it is over here. He said, no, 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 no. The kingdom of God will be within you. So every person that we lead to Christ, God's kingdom expands every time somebody prays that prayer to accept Jesus into their heart. The kingdom of God expands in the earth because his kingdom is in each one that prays that prayer. And the more his kingdom expands, the more heaven like the earth will become. The greater the light shines, the less darkness will be. The more we hide our light, the greater the darkness will be. Doesn't matter who's in the White House. It doesn't. It matters, is the church shining or has the church hidden its light? That's all that matters. Amen. Praise the Lord. So the contemporary English version of the same one, it says this. It says, come and set up your kingdom so that everyone on earth will obey you. That's the contemporary uh, English version. Just as you're obeyed in heaven. This is what we're supposed to be praying. God, let your kingdom expand into every human heart until everyone on this earth is obedient to you. <laughs> it can't happen! God is like, he's really good at doing what people think can't be done. Like really good at doing the impossible. It's impossible! That is kind of, I think, the thing that fuels God. Right? It's like, yeah, you guys don't think it can happen? <laughs> you know how awesome I am? Do you know how glorious I am? Do you know how wise I am? <laughs> yeah, it's going to happen. Just like I said, it would happen. It will happen. It will happen. And, and by the way, I'm just trying to let you know it is happening. It is happening. I know they don't report it on the news. I know it doesn't hit all the cycles. It doesn't flip over on Facebook. You don't get to see a bunch of it. But for the missionaries that are in these other countries, man, it is happening all over the place. Revival is spreading in nations like never before. I'm telling you. And, 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 so, and so the seeds that have been planted in these other nations, right now there are many nations in a harvest season. And the church is growing faster than the population growth. Hallelujah. It's time for the America to get back to that. Amen? Amen? Praise the Lord. All right. So how does God restore all things? Well, here's how God does it. He starts by restoring you. <laughs> That's why it takes so long. Because God's vision of restoring everything is to start with the individual. I'm going to start with you. Matter of fact, I'm going to start with your heart. I'm going to start restoring your soul. And before you know it, after I've restored your soul, then I'm going to restore you. And then after I restore you, then I'm going to start to restore the people around you. 
And when I start to restore the people around you, then I'm going to start to restore the community. Do you understand what I'm saying? See, God is all about seed and harvest. Planting seeds, letting them grow, and reaping the harvest. And so he starts with each one of us. Go ahead and throw up the next slide. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. And the plans I have are to prosper you, not to harm you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. My plans are to bring you into success, not bring you into suffering. All right? Now, now. Plans to give you hope and a future. That's pretty cool. Let's look at it in a few other translations. Amen. Contemporary English version, I guess, says, I will bless you with a future filled with hope. Can I tell you, that is not what I hear on Facebook and social media. I don't, I don't hear Christians talking about this hope-filled future that God said, I got these plans, and these plans are going to give you hope for your future. But you know what I do find? That the Bible, when it begins to tell us about the end goal of God for planning the church, it is way more hope-filled, and it's got a really bright future. It's got a very victorious future <laughs> where the church ends in victory. And all the nations and all the rulers of the nations have become followers of Jesus. That the seeds that he planted and that the disciples gave up their life for will come to fruition and they will continue to go and grow until the kingdom of God has spread across the entire earth. That's a pretty hope-filled future. The Amplified says it this way. It says, to give you hope in your final outcome. God wants to give you hope in the final outcome. Amen. Don't go by what you see right now, but the final outcome of your life, the final outcome of this world. There is hope in the final outcomes. Amen. So God's going to start with you and he's going to start with me. Now, here's the deal, guys. None of us got to pick where we got started, where we started from. Like I didn't get to pick my family. I didn't get to pick and you didn't get to pick yours either. None of us got to pick where we start, but we can pick where we will end. See, there's these plans that God has for us, and if we'll be willing and obedient, if we'll be led by His Spirit, then He's going to take us by the hand, and He's going to walk us into an expected end. And things while you're walking won't always look like it's going to turn out the way God says it's going to turn out. But see, His eye is on the final outcome, not on the temporary thing you're facing. And we've got to get our vision around the final outcome instead of the temporary things we hear and see. We get so moved by what we see because we don't have a we don't have God's we got to get God's vision so that we're not so moved by what we hear and by what we see because we understand the final outcome. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So God wants to do some amazing things in our lives too. Now here's the thing that I found out about it is because we didn't get to pick where we start, that's normally what we're struggling with for the rest of our lives. Well, if I just had a more loving family? Well, our family, if they just had more money. Can I tell you, ain't no, nobody, here's a universal truth for you. Nobody had everything. Doesn't matter. White, black, nobody had everything. Hispanic, Chinese, nobody had ever. Nobody had everything. Somebody had riches and they were born into wealth, but both their parents were working and they missed out on the love that you got to experience. And you didn't have money, but you had both your parents and they loved you and they did stuff with you. Are you understand what I'm trying to tell you? We are all deficient somewhere because imperfect people can never give us perfection. All right? So everybody has a deficiency someplace. 
And normally what I find is that people are not trying to get success and joy. Most people's goal in life, most people's goal is to, is to get what they feel was missing. I didn't have the dad that I wanted. So that woman will go to all kinds of men trying to find that father figure that she's always wanted. I didn't have the mom that I always wanted. I didn't have, I didn't have things. And so, so they will sell out their whole life to try to have stuff because they didn't grow up with stuff. We are selling out our whole life in a pursuit of, of trying to find the one thing or the two things we didn't have growing up thinking that that's what's going to make us happy and give us joy and fulfillment. (laughs) But we're not seeking joy because we could have just got off that roller coaster ride. We could have stopped chasing our tail and actually just found joy. But instead, no, we've got to have joy this way. It must be done this way. And so, praise the Lord, throw up the next slide there. Most people are stuck. We get stuck. We're trying to chase the thing that we feel that we didn't have. And what God wants us to do, he wants us to transition into just chasing him. Stop chasing the stuff you think you didn't have growing up. Quit that and just start chasing Jesus. I'm telling you, if you have Jesus, you're going to have everything because Jesus is the only perfect one that can give you perfection. And I've met a bunch of people that chased that one thing they feel they didn't have, and and they were trying to save their life, and they lost it. Yeah, they got money, but they lost their family. Are you listening to me? With Satan and this world system, there is always an exchange. To gain one thing, you've got to give something else up. And so Jesus said, hey, listen, stop playing by the world's rules and just start playing by mine. Just chase after me, pursue me. And so this is what the Bible says about it. If we will, praise the Lord. Matthew says, be concerned above everything else with the kingdom of God. What do you mean? The expansion of the kingdom, of getting Jesus into human hearts, of taking the kingdom that is in you and putting it in others until it covers the globe. That is all you need to be concerned about. You're going to have a life after this life that you're going to have. It's going to be glorious and wonderful. But right now, I need you to make this world wonderful for the next generation. And if you will be concerned about the kingdom expansion so that my will can start getting done on earth like it is being done in heaven. If you will concern yourself with that, and with what God is requiring of you in this generation. Now is not the time to live. Your, I'm going to live my best life now. I'm living my best life now. Not me. This is the worst life I will ever experience. The life I get to live on the other side of this place is my best life. Hallelujah. It is my best life. Now you're going to hell. This is your best life now. I guess you live it up. Do whatever you can because this is not going to get better than here. But no, 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 no. I'm going for the kingdom, man. This is, no matter how great this life will be, it will always pale in comparison to the life that God is offering us. This is the rescue mission. That's what we're on. And God says, if you will go rescue my people and expand my kingdom, you do the things I'm asking you to do, I'm going to provide you with all these other things things if you seek the things i gotta get the thing i didn't get growing up if you try to save your life you're gonna lose it you ain't never finding joy success and happiness in that but if you will give up that stuff and start chasing my kingdom instead and you start expanding my kingdom You're not going to miss out on anything. I will supply all your needs according to my riches and glory. I will move heaven and earth for you. 
We actually saw God do that this week, didn't we? Amen. We had some testimonies, praise the Lord, from some of our church members of God moving heaven and earth for them because they are chasing after the king. Amen. Come on. He's going to provide us with everything. It's the secret to life. Amen. Let's go ahead and throw up the next one. Praise the Lord. So uh, Psalm 40, it says this. I, I waited patiently. I just love the psalmists. Amen. He says, I waited patiently for the Lord. And, and he turned to me and he heard my cry. And then he lifted me out of the pit of destruction. Because how does God do the, how does he restore all things? The restoration of all things starts with the restoration of you the restoration of me. And before you know it, so many things gets restored through that restoration that now he begins to restore everything else. The Bible says all of creation is groaning and longing for the sons of God to come into their own. Because because creation realizes that when we get our act together, (laughs) it gets free from its bondage. God starts the liberating process with us, but after it has gone through us, it then turns to the world. And then the world gets to escape the corruption of its bondage into the glorious freedom and liberty of the sons of God. Amen. So he says, listen, uh, man, he heard my cry. He lifted me out of the pit of destruction and out of the sticky mud. You know what that sticky mud is? That's the stuff you think you didn't have growing up. That's that sticky mud. You keep getting stuck in that. And he said, no, he lifted me up out of that. And then he stood, he stood me on a rock and he made my feet steady. He put a new song in my mouth. Man, I got a skip in my step. I got some joy about me. A song of praise to my God. And then it goes on to tell us this. It doesn't stop there. Many people then see that. When you get the skip in your step and the song of praise in your heart, praise the Lord, and you say, and God's pulled you up out, and now you're steady on the rock, people take notice of that. And see, many people will see this, and then they too will come, and they will worship him. Why does God want to pull you up out and put your feet on the rock and give you the joy of the Lord and the peace that passes all understanding and move in your life and heal your body and restore your soul and do this work in you? Because when he does it in you, other people get to see what he did in you, and before they know it, you don't even have to go trying to witness to them. They will literally come to you. What do you got? I don't understand. You got something I don't have. I need what you have. How are you so steady? How are you not filled with fear? How is it that you're walking through this the way you're walking through this? How do you have a joy that is never removed from you? And then they will trust in the Lord too. Happy is the person who trusts in the Lord, who doesn't turn to those who are proud. We don't need God. We have science. Yeah, huh? Why is it that that one subject can have two totally different groups of scientists saying two totally different things, but we're supposed to believe that one group is right and the other group is wrong, but each party is telling us that their group is the right group and the other group is the wrong group? You know why? Because science isn't science anymore. Science used to be observation. Now, we just back whatever narratives we want, and we call it science. Somebody say, God is dead. God's not dead. He's alive. You know what's dead? Science is dead. It, it died a few years ago. <laughs> you know, like, it is dead. True science is dead. But true scientists will tell you, A little bit of science may take you away from God, but a lot of science will always bring you back to him. It's true. So happy is the person that trusts in the Lord. They're not not trusting in people that are proud. 
Do not turn into those that are worshiping false gods. Instead, Lord my God, you have done many miracles. Look at this. Come on, the plans of God for you. The plans for us are many. God doesn't have just one plan for you. He got all kinds of plans for you. He's got plans in your finances. He's got plans in your marriage. He's got plans. I mean, he's got plans all over the place. He's got all kinds of plans for you. And what he does to get you into all these different plans he has is he does a ton of miracles to get you there. He said, you've done many miracles. Why would you do all those miracles? Because you got a bunch of plans for me. God has a lot of plans for this earth. And he's going to do a whole bunch of miracles, praise the Lord, to get this place to be what he needs it to be. The difference with God is that he's not like us. He's not impatient. He's sowing the seeds and he's patiently waiting for his tree to grow until it does exactly what he said it was going to do. And it will. Amen. And it may take 2,000 years or 3,000 years. Doesn't really matter, does it? Doesn't matter if it took 10,000 years. It will become what he said it will become. Amen. If I tried to tell all these plans to you, there wouldn't be too, that man, there'd be too many to even count. God has so many plans, so many miracles, so many things he wants to do. And he's doing them. He's doing them through his church. Praise the Lord. So Job says it this way. It says God is always doing great things. He's always doing great things. God is always at work. He's always active. He's always doing some great things. So I haven't been seeing those great things in my life. <laughs> All right, well, let's start to, in, in the first one, let's do away with evil, and let's start to seek the Lord, okay? And I'm telling you, if you will surrender yourself to the Lord Jesus, you will see all kinds of miracles and all kinds of plans. And God will start doing all kinds of stuff to those that are surrendering. And over this world, in this world, every day new people are surrendering. And every day God is doing some great things on their behalf. They cannot be explained. How did it happen? I have no idea how it happened. It's impossible. But not with God. All things are possible with God. And countless awesome deeds. You can't even count how many awesome things God is doing every day on this planet. And that he wants to do every day in your life. So, praise the Lord. Uh, John tells us this in chapter 20, verse 30. It says, Jesus performed many other wondrous signs. He did all kinds of wondrous signs. So John said, hey, listen, I wrote down some of the signs of what Jesus did. But can I tell you, that was just to show you that he was Messiah. But he did so many other things that are not written in this book. I couldn't write them all down. Next chapter, he goes on to tell you this. Chapter 21, he says, there are so many things Jesus said and did that if these accounts were also written down, the books could not be contained in the entire cosmos. I mean, like God is doing so much all the time that if you really wrote down everything that he is doing and working and I'm just trying to get you to see this is what God's activity is and this is how his activity works. This is how he wants to be in our lives, in everybody's life. He is doing billions of miracles for, for billions of individuals. If you saw how many miracles God has done behind the scenes, some that you're not even aware of, when you get to heaven and you see all his activity behind the scenes, you're going to be shocked at how much he was moving mountains for your, on your behalf. Yeah. Amen. So, praise the Lord. Jeremiah tells us that the Lord said to me, you have seen well. For I am actively watching over my word to fulfill it. God is actively in heaven watching. Who's saying my word? Who's putting it into their mouth? Who's aligning themselves with me? Come on. Who, who is surrendering to me? Why? Because I'm about to do something in their lives. Amen. Praise the Lord. The next verse tells us this in Psalm 14, 2 says, the Lord has looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if they are any who understand. 
who are acting wisely. Doesn't anybody get it? God is looking from heaven to see, do they get it? Sin is creating their hell. Righteousness, come on, is going to create heaven on earth. The more righteousness that gets placed into the earth, the more heaven-like it becomes. And when it and at one point, I will then step in and renew it all. Are they not understanding? Do they get it? He's looking. Is there anybody wise in this age? Is there anybody who can see that if they do the vision that I've given the church to do, if they fulfill the assignment, heaven invades earth. Is there any that truly seek after God, longing for his wisdom and for his guidance? I don't want this way anymore. I don't want this world anymore. I don't want this stuff anymore. I want you, God. I want to know your ways. I want to live according to your paths. All your ways are life. None of them bring me into death. The ways of the world are death. They all bring pain and destruction. Amen. Come on, man, the church has done a really bad job at preaching the gospel, man. Within the church, you still have this idea, and in the world, it is even more, uh, it is even, it believed even, the lie is believed even more. That sin is all the fun stuff that we don't get to do as Christians. And righteousness is all the boring stuff we got to do because we're serving Jesus. Dude, if that's your experience in Christianity, ain't no wonder you're half-hearted. Man, you are bought into Satan's soup, man. You are drinking the satanic Kool-Aid. <laughs> Sin is all the stuff that destroys my life. It brings pain into my life. It darkens my understanding. It dulls me out. It numbs me out. Sin is what causes my relationships to fail. It's what causes me to lose my best friends. It's what causes me to have my wife want to divorce my sorry butt, right? Sin is the thing that is constantly destroying, stealing, killing, messing up everything we love most. Sin will destroy my children. It will destroy my kids. I'm telling you, you nobody wants to send their, their children into school. Why? Because of because of the lawlessness that's running rampant and the pain that they see is happening to their children because of all the lawlessness that's allowed. Is anybody waking up yet to realize that sin hurts us? It always has and it always will. But righteousness is what brings joy and success and peace and victory. Righteousness is the things that gives me the fullness of all the things my heart truly desires. And sin is the stuff that makes it so that everything I love, I destroy. Is anybody waking up yet? Is anybody understanding this? God's looking. Those that will truly seek him and long for his wisdom, not the world's. And for his ways. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. What do we got up here? Amen. First Corinthians chapter 15, it says that Christ the Messiah is the first fruits. That's pretty awesome. Christ is the first fruits. He's the first one that got resurrected from the dead. He went into hell in our place. He bore the, penalty, the punishment and penalty for our sin. In hell, he conquered Satan, preached to the captives, rose again triumphantly, and was the first fruit of the resurrection. Because of what Jesus pioneered when we die, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. 
and and we get to become a part of the great cloud of witnesses that are in heaven that are watching the activity of God in the earth until everything God said happens will happen and we get to rule and reign with Christ now but then we get to rule and reign with Christ when we see him in as the, as part of that great heavenly crowd cloud of witnesses amen So this resurrection pioneered our resurrection, but one day it won't just be a spiritual resurrection where we get to go in heaven. One day it's actually going to be a physical resurrection too where we get glorified bodies. It says, then those who are Christ's own will be resurrected. And this resurrection has to do with the resurrection that gives us a glorified body. Why do we get a glorified body? Because now we're back in a glorified earth. It's just like Adam and Eve all over again, everybody. So you get a body for a glorified earth because you now are going to be living in a glorified earth. I can't wait for my glorified body. Amen. Eat all the Krispy Kreme donuts I want and not gain any weight. You know what I'm saying? Like, can't wait for that glorified body. <laughs> Jesus done walk through walls. I'm going to pop in on John every now and again. Just boop. Hey, what's up, man? <laughs> that I mean, glorified body is awesome. All the limitations of this body are gone. So, but when does this happen? It happens at his coming. After that comes the end or the completion. Now, the completion is when all things get restored. It's the restoration of all things. And notice what it says, though. It says, now, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father. So God says, hey, listen, come, sit at my right side and rule the nations. But then once all of these things have been submitted underneath his feet, then he delivers it back to the Father and says, Here, God, Father, look at what I was able to accomplish through my church. Here you are. Amen. But he's not going to deliver this to the Father till after. After what? After rendering inoperative and abolishing every other rule in every other authority, in every other power. Now, can I tell you something? He, he already abolished the rule, right? Because the kingdom of darkness was stripped down. Amen. But he's also abolishing every other authority, every other nation. All nations will come underneath his authority. There will be a season, a time that every nation becomes a Christian nation. And all other powers, there will be a time that all false religions are removed off the face of the earth. That every nation becomes a Christian nation and that all false religions have been abolished. It's impossible, pastor. I guess Jesus isn't coming back in my lifetime. No, he's probably not. He's going to come as soon as his church has completed the objective. If we can complete it in our lifetime, he'll come back in our lifetime. If we can't complete it in our lifetime, he ain't coming back yet. Can you see that? But once it's completed after this has happened, Christ, he, see, come on now, for Christ must be king and reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Amen. And that's what he's doing in heaven right now. And so it goes on to tell us this, praise the Lord, the very last enemy that gets subdued and abolished is death. And that happens at his return. Man, I'll tell you what, the church's vision God's vision for the church is not a vision of defeat. It's a vision of success. His vision for your life is not a vision of defeat. It's a vision of success. God wants to start by renewing you so that he can then begin to renew the people around you. And before you know it, he is renewing because if each one of us is letting that happen and we're letting our light shine in that way, and we are fully surrendering ourselves to the Lordship of Jesus. Can I tell you, as soon as that takes place, other people are going to happen too. And if everybody in the church is doing that, come on, man, how many, how many Christians we got? We got a lot of them across the earth. If all of us started to do that, 
Did you know that if every believer won one person to Jesus this year, and then every believer won one person to Jesus next year, right? So we get everybody saved, and and we get them trained up the same way. So every believer the following year wins one person to Jesus. We could win the entire globe in two years. It could be done quick, and Jesus could come back in our lifetime. If we get our act together. <laughs> Are you listening to me? Hallelujah. Glory. Amen. With every head bow and every eye closed, I just want you to know how much Jesus loves you. He loves you so much. And he wants to have access into your life. See, that is part of the renewal process. That is the start of that renewal process the start of everything that God wants to do. Somebody say, well, if God's in heaven, why is there so much hell on earth? Because, because sin is on earth. And sin is what creates the hell we experience here. So what God wants to do is he actually wants to remove that from the earth. Because that's never been part of his plan for you. But the secret in having it removed is each one of us then has to surrender. And we have to say, God, I want you to start with me. Take my life and fill me and use me. Restore my soul. Restore me, God. Lead me in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. It's where it all begins. If you're in this place and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, but you would like to, you would like to ask Jesus to come into your heart to be your Lord and Savior, I want to pray with you today. Would you just raise your hand and I'll pray with you? Nobody's looking around and nobody's going to, it's just between you and Jesus. Thank you. So this is what we want to do as a church. Let's just undergird and support those that rose their hand. And let's just say this, say, say, Jesus I believe in you. I believe that you came and paid for my sin, shed your blood, and died in my place so that I could experience your life. So here is my heart. I open up the door to you, Jesus. Come into my heart. Rule as king inside me. Expand your kingdom within me, I ask. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.